So uh, my name is Aaron Brown, lead pastor here at Woods Chapel, and I've been gone on vacation for a few weeks, and it's good to be back, you know? I was back all week, and, and this is my first time back uh, up here on stage for a few weeks, and it is good to be back. Oh, you probably wonder, what did Aaron do when he was on vacation for three weeks? Well, one week we went out to uh, Colorado for a wedding. Some very close family friends out there had an absolute blast. And several of us at the wedding caught COVID. So the next week was uh, COVID recovery week uh, here in Lee Summit. So all those little projects I had planned did not get done. And then the third week we went down to Joplin and uh, spent some time with uh, old friends down there. And in amongst those three weeks, we moved our older daughter, Zoe, twice. Well, we moved her stuff from From Springfield to Lee Summit, our garage was full. Then we moved her another week or two weeks later from Lee Summit to Lawrence. She's going to KU. I hope that's okay with you guys. Um, And starting her master's degree there. Um, And along at the same time, our youngest daughter, Abby, ended up spending about nine days in in a hospital. Um, So it was... uh, let me put it this way. It's good to be back. It's good to be back. It's good to be back. And what we're doing today in, in terms of the message is continuing the series that we've been in, which is better decisions, fewer regrets. Better decisions, fewer regrets. And the whole idea, the whole concept here, and I really believe this to be true, if we digest this information well, you will live a life with ha- having made better decisions, and because of that, fewer regrets. That is the the whole goal. And not only for you, but so that you are equipped and that I am equipped because of what we're going through to help our kids make better decisions and have fewer regrets. Our grandkids, our nieces, our nephews, our godchildren, you know, right there, that if we press into this, we will come out the other end much, much better with a preferred future that we really want. We're drawing a lot of information from a book by the same name by Andy Stanley. And I, I do believe that if we internalize this, it changes outcomes. And here's one of the, the truths that we're leaning into. It's simply that good questions lead to good decisions, which lead to fewer regrets. Good questions, asking the right questions. And, and so what we're doing is equipping ourselves with five questions. And if you missed one of the questions so far, go back to the website, hit them, because you don't want to like miss out on one of the five questions. You need them all. And, and the, the questions have, have led us to this place where we know that if we ask the right questions financially, relationally, academically, professionally, we get where we want to be. They shape our lives. And I'm convinced that if you'll ask And answer honestly and act on these five questions that preferred future unfolds. And and just as important, not only does it unfold for you, but your decisions impact a whole bunch of people, don't they? I mean, it's the truth. Other people's decisions impact you too. But if we nail this down, it affects those people who, who you work with, work for, depend on you. It affects their lives to. So here are the questions so far that we've asked. If you missed one of these, you might want to jot these down. Am I being honest with myself? Really? That, that little last word is important. Am I being, being honest with myself? Really? Second question is, what story do I want to tell? That's the legacy question. The third question is, is there a tension that deserves my attention? You know, when we're facing something and we feel that weird feeling inside, that tension inside. Is there a tension that deserves my attention? And the fourth question we're going to get to in a minute, but I do want to remind you a couple things. Number one, take notes. Um, we got those cool, uh, as, as Brian calls them, sleek journals. <laughs> if you want, take notes in there, do that. Take them on your phone, wherever. But uh, taking notes is just a reminder to us that we're not consumers. We're not here to consume a religious worship service. We are meant to be messengers and ambassadors, and what we're learning here is meant to go out into the world around us. So take notes, uh, and then use the reflection guides. And the reflection guides are on our website, and they are there to help carry what we're doing here into the rest of the week. So Monday through the rest of the week, there's something there, scriptures to go deeper, questions to reflect on. Please use those. So I'm going to get in your business here for a minute and ask you, how was your drive to church today? Was it uh, pretty uneventful? Did you get here on time? Uh, have, have a chance to have a donut and some coffee and visit with friends out in the lobby? Was it, was it kind of pretty chill? Or were you in a panic to get here before the message even started today? What was it? Oh, let me ask it a different way. How many of you all broke the speed limit to get here to church today? 
All right, all right, the honest ones. How, uh, so, so you broke the law, and, and, and here's the thing. You broke the law to get to church on time or get here whenever you got here. Um, but if you are a, you, a, a typical person, you tend to, especially on the highway, drive over the speed limit. All right? How many of you all do this? Drive over the... Okay, there we go. Now honesty breaks out in church. So we, we drive a little bit, and, and here's, here's the, 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 what, what experts tell us is going on in our heads, is that we don't feel guilty about breaking the law a little bit. We cross the line. We don't feel guilty about breaking the law a little bit, but we also don't want to get caught by the law. We want to break the law, but, but avoid being caught by the law. And, and it's kind of one of those things where we, we, we know that there is a line somewhere in there, don't we? And that's the line that we write. And the only thing is, we don't just apply that line in driving, but I don't know, some people would say, well, when it comes to our health, our diets, what we eat, we'll, we'll push the line. Uh, curfews for young people, right? You got a curfew? Push that five more minutes, five more minutes, five more minutes, and then you're 15 minutes late and you blew it and you, got, you get grounded or whatever. You know, we, we push the line in so many different ways. And, and what, what is that line? Well, let's name it. It's the line between responsible and irresponsible. It's the line between moral and immoral. It's the line between legal and illegal. It's the line between I'm still in control and I need help now. Whether it's driving, diet, curfews, drinking, spending, our natural tendency is to, to live real close to that line, as close to the line as possible. As close to the line as possible. And, and we do that as close to the line as possible. We kind of snuggle up to that edge of disaster because, you know, we, we don't want to get grounded for a young person. Oh, we don't want to lose our jobs. We don't, want to, we don't want to be embarrassed publicly. We don't want to get kicked out of the house. We don't, we don't want to get expelled from school. But we just ride that line. We snuggle with that line. And here's the thing. Uh, fueling this flirtation with disaster, this line of disaster, is a flawed assumption we need to name the flawed assumption. It really messes with our ability to make good decisions, this flawed assumption. And, and, and the assumption, though, is why we're so comfortable living on the edge right there when it comes to dating, spending, drinking, eating, driving, whatever it is. Here's the assumption I'm talking about. If it's not wrong, then it's all right. If it's not illegal, then it's clearly permissible. If it's not immoral, it's acceptable. And if it's not over the line, it's fine. A nice little rhyme there. If it's not over the line, it's fine. Now, here's the thing about these assumptions. If you're a parent, you would never parent your child with these assumptions, would you? Why? Because it's the lowest common denominator. We, we expect more. We want more from the people that we love. I mean, you, you wouldn't set that bar for anybody that you care about. But basically, it's asking the question, how close to bad can I be without actually being bad? How close to wrong can I get without actually doing something wrong? Or, or if you're religious, how, how close to sin can I get without actually sinning? See what I'm talking about? That's the line. And, and these false assumptions, they just really mess with our decision making. But it doesn't stop there because before long, what ends up happening is we go over the line. Over the line. How far can I go over the line without getting caught, without experiencing some form of consequence or embarrassment? How unethical, how immoral, how insensitive can I be without really, really experiencing consequences? How long can I neglect my family? How long can I neglect my health? How long can I neglect my finances before I start really feeling the effects? How much can I indulge in an addictive behavior before I actually get addicted? I mean, it's a slippery, dangerous slope. And it all starts by asking the wrong question. And the wrong question is, is anything wrong with this? That is the wrong question. Is anything wrong with this? Because that question is usually followed by another, even worse question, which is, how did I get myself into this? Right? And here's the thing. We already know that this is, this is the truth because, 
because when we see, and it's so much easier to see it in other people, when they are doing something and you're like, oh my gosh, what are they doing? I love them. Why are they doing this? We ask the question of them because we can't always see it in ourselves. And, and when we get concerned about somebody, it's not necessarily concerned about what they're doing in the moment. It's concerned about where they're headed, right? It may not be like with our kids especially, like, hey, you know, they think it's no big deal, Dad. I'm just blah, blah, blah. And like, wait, but I know it's just blah, blah, blah. But the direction you're headed, and, and by the way, this points to the principle of the path that we talked about in the very first week of the series. And the principle, principle of the path is that direction, not intention, determines destination. Direction, not intention, determines destination. And the illustration I use, like, hey, you want to go to Florida? You know, you're packing up your, your, your swimmy things and your snorkels and all that. You want to go to Florida? You head north on I, I-35. You are not going to get to Florida, no matter what your intentions are, because direction, not intention, determines destination. When we see people around us doing things, they may not be wrong things. They may not be illegal things. They may not be immoral things. But we're like, man, the direction you're headed. So the wrong question to ask is, is this wrong? That leads to the fourth question, which I believe is the question that if we ask this, we avoid the avoidable regrets. If we ask this, if the people we love ask this, they avoid the avoidable regrets. Here's the fourth question. What is the wise thing to do? We're going to unpack this. What is the wise thing to do? When making a decision of any importance, we pause to ask, okay, what is the wise thing to do? Will you say it out loud with me? Ready? One, two, three. What is the wise thing to do? So we're not talking A. Is this, is this legal or illegal? Is this moral, immoral? We're asking, is this the wise thing to do? Because refusing to ask that question almost always, not always, but almost always leads to suffering. Here's how uh, an Old Testament proverb puts it. This is Proverbs 27, 12. I love this passage. It's always kind of rung in my heart. It says, The prudent see danger and they take refuge, but the simple keep going and pay the penalty. Now, the prudent, what, what does that word mean? It's just another word for the wise, right? And the word simple in there, the, the, the simple, uh, it can be translated naive and it means unwise. So the wise see danger coming, and what do they do? Take refuge. They get out of the way. They take action. The unwise see danger coming, and they just keep going, and they suffer for it. I mean, it, isn't that true of your greatest regret in life? What is your greatest regret in life? I would wager that your greatest regret was precipitated by a series of unwise decisions. And that thing that you want to take back, that thing that you want to undo in your life, that day, that weekend, that season, that decade, that you would want to change more than anything, it was precipitated by a whole bunch of, not necessarily wrong decisions, but unwise decisions. We know this. We know this. Here's how the Apostle Paul talked about this idea of, of wisdom. He says, Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. <clears throat> what I, I read this and I think, gosh, a lot has improved since the first century to the 21st century, but human nature has not changed all that much because <clears throat> Paul's telling them to be wise and careful. He's Telling them that, and we still need the same, same guidance. Be wise. Be careful. And, and thus our question, what is the wise thing to do? Paul, Paul continues up with a bit, little bit more explanation. He says, making the most of every opportunity. And literally in Greek, this phrase can be translated, redeeming or ransom, ransoming the time. Redeeming or ransoming the time. <clears throat> I mean, don't you wish you could go back? and redeem some of the unwise decisions that you made in life up to this point? Don't you wish you could go back and, and redeem the, the time that you lost kind of undoing the results of unwise decisions? And like, don't, don't you wish you could do that? And, and of course, uh, you can't. 
you can't do that. You can't go back, but you can go forward. Uh, somebody told me this this last week, and I can't remember who told me. If it was you, let me know so that I can, I can give you proper credit. But somebody, just in passing, we were talking about something, and they said, the best day to plant a tree is 20 years ago. The second best day to plant a tree is today. I love that. That just stuck in my brain. Because it's what Paul's getting at here. You cannot undo the past, but you can make wise decisions in the present that will affect the future. That's the best time to do that. Paul's inviting us to use our time wisely because time is the most valuable asset that any of us have. And use it in a way that actually propels you into your preferred future. Be wise. And Paul, and Paul says this too, uh, be wise about the future because he drops this little nugget in there, because the days are evil. Like, oh gosh, what, what is he talking about there? I think he's talking about the internet. No, I'm just kidding. Um, social media, um, what's he talking about? He's just, he's naming what's in his culture. It's also in our culture that we don't live in a morally, ethically neutral culture. We... Oh, so, so like, you don't see ads or read ads that tell you, hey, by the way, be careful, be wise, <laughs> be prudent, you know? You, you don't see ads that say that. You don't, you don't, you're not ever in a, in a situation where a, a sales associate says, now just go ahead and sleep on this for a couple nights and come back and make a decision later. What do we live in a culture that says over and over to us, get it now, not later, more, not less. And that's the culture. And I think that's what Paul's getting at. Is we, our culture is not going to help us very much at all when it comes to being wise and asking the question, what is the wise thing to do? Wendy well, Stanley suggests that, that the question needs to be expanded, what's the wise thing to do, to include really three facets. So in, in light of my past... In light of my present circumstances, in light of my future hopes and dreams, what is the wise thing to do? In light of my past, my present, and my future, what's the wise thing to do? And, and you've heard the saying, those who can't remember the past are doomed to repeat it. Have you heard that before? Those who can't remember the past are doomed to repeat it. It means if you make these mistakes now, if you don't look back and learn from yesterday, you're going to keep repeating those same things into the future. You're going to have the same trouble tomorrow. Let's talk about past. Because our, our past, your personal past, influences your specific temptations, addictions, and blind spots, just to name a few things. And, and your temptations, possible addictions, and blind spots are different than mine. They're not worse or better. They're just different. We, we all have different ones because of our past. So in light of your personal past, what is the wise thing to do now? An example. Um, Maybe you have in your family history alcoholism, right? That's in your personal past. You have an alcoholism tendency. What is the wise thing to do in light of that? You know the answer. Avoid alcohol. Um, another example, if you've got a personal history of uh, having anger issues and you're getting married, you're about to get married, in light of that past, having a past with anger issues, what is the wise thing to do in the present well, I tell you, it is to make the phone call to a counselor. Make the time. Find the money and work on those anger issues before you get married and during the first six months of your marriage. It will save you so much pain and anguish and heartache. That's the why, in light of your past, what is the wise thing to do? Is the Holy Spirit bubbling anything up in your life right now? A thought? Something in your past? She's like, man, yeah, that is. That's something that I need to be wise about so that I can lean into my preferred future. Financially, professionally, academically. I mean, you don't want to set yourself up to fail because of something in your past. So be wise. Um, in light of my past experiences, and then in light of my current circumstances. Current circumstances. What is going on right now that may affect you, and, and you're different because of it right now than you were a year ago or than you will be in a year because it's just what's going on right now. 
I think what's going on in our family. Um, so you know, we've been here. We've been here just a little over a year, um, and and people ask me, so how's your year been? You know, okay, everybody's curious. How's your year been here in Lee Summit? And I, I have two answers that I always uh, tie together. And one is it's been utterly amazing because the church has been so receptive and loving and caring and and ready. It's just and looking after our family. But I have to tie that to. My second answer, which is it's been the hardest year of my life, of our family's lives. You know, and, and a lot of it because of our youngest daughter, Abby, right? She's 16, and, and for the last three months, she's been in a residential therapy school. And every day is a different day. And we just want the best for her, right? And we don't know what's going to happen on any given day, and what her interactions are going to be like. And, what progress is she going to make? And, and here's what I'm getting at. Be, because of our current circumstances, we're different people right now than we were a couple years ago and than we will be in a year. And, and so we've got to take that into account because, because of what's going on currently, we react differently. I, I'm just wearing my emotions on my sleeve all the time now because, you know, when you've got family turmoil, that kind of happens. Um, I realized that, that we have to rest differently than we did. We have to manage our time differently. We have to create margin in our lives differently because we don't know day to day. I also recognize that, that I'm a lot more irritable than I was. And so, you know, I, I, I need to offer myself some grace in that because our current circumstance, in light of that, what is the wise thing to do? That means we make different decisions in light of the current circumstances. A whole other illustration would be this. Uh, um, did you just get out of a relationship? Just gone through a breakup of some sort? Is it good to jump right into a new relationship right after that? Is it wrong to jump into a new relationship right after that? No, it is not wrong to jump into a new relationship right after that. But that's not the question we're asking, is it? The question we're asking it is, is it the wise thing to do? And after a big breakup, you got a whole bunch of emotions, you've got a whole bunch of things to think through and connections to manage and all that. So in light of that, what is the wise thing to do? You see the difference between asking, is it wrong and is it wise? In light of your current circumstances, what is the wise thing for you to do? So in light of my past experiences, my current circumstances, my future hopes and dreams, Past, present, future hopes and dreams. What is the wise thing to do? And, and you know, I just got to talk for a minute about the heartbreak. It is heartbreaking, isn't it? You, you've done, you've seen this. It is heartbreaking watching people make decisions that undermine their own future. The, their own hopes and dreams. People making it. It's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking to watch individuals or couples um, Make relationship decisions that are going to undermine their, their future. It's heartbreaking to, to watch teenagers make decisions that are going to result in consequences that will chase after them for a decade or two decades maybe. It's heartbreaking to watch parents parent in a way that is eventually going to create a wedge between them and their kids. It's, we can always see it better in other people, can't we? We can always see it better from that perspective. But to avoid the damage, the avoidable regret, this is so important. In light of your future hopes and dreams, what is the wise thing for you to do? Because chances are, I'm going to assume this, that you have a picture of what you want your future to look like. You've got a, a picture. Maybe you've even, you've even written it out before. Maybe you haven't. But you've got a mental picture of your preferred future, what it could be like, what it should be like. But you got to know this if you don't know it already. When it comes to dreams, man, life is hard on dreams. There is a headwind when it comes to dreams in life. And if we're not careful, if you're not careful, you got the potential to contribute to the demise of your own future. So please, don't, don't rob yourself of your own future. I mean, nobody plans to undermine their own future. They just don't plan not to. You know what I'm saying? You don't plan to undermine your future. You don't plan to not undermine your future. So in light of your future hopes and dreams, what's the wise thing for you to do? And this question with the future in mind brings 
clarity to whatever options you're considering and asking this question in light of your future hopes and dreams puts a spotlight on your excuses. Can we talk about making excuses for a second? I'm a little uncomfortable because we all do it. Our excuses that we make for why we make decisions and unwise decisions, our excuses are very persuasive because most of them are at least partly true. I mean, you aren't doing anything wrong yet. You can handle it initially. It's not illegal, we say. God will forgive me. But listen, the purpose of this fourth question isn't to stop you from doing something wrong It's to keep you from doing something unwise. Doing something unwise is a gateway, a gateway decision. You do something unwise, it's a gateway. What do I mean by gateway decision? You walk through this gateway and you have entered into a whole new environment. You want to be careful with gateway decisions because they change everything. You can get to a point of no return. So the the question becomes, when it comes to your excuses, you know which ones you use, right? I know the ones I use. Would you be willing to put away all those old, worn-out excuses? Because they've never served you well, have they? Your excuses have never helped you in life, ever. They they just cloud your reasoning, and ultimately they, they really diminish your ability to hear the voices of wisdom that are around you. Because you got your excuses. Our excuses, you know what they do? Here's what our excuses do. They escort you to the threshold of regret, and then they leave you there with no margin to get out. So isn't it time to be done with those excuses? So instead of excusing yourself forward into your preferred future, what do we do? We dream ourselves there. We plan our way into that preferred future. I mean, let's talk specifics here. I mean, you're going to be somewhere in five or ten years financially. You're going to be there. I mean, wouldn't it be better to plan your way into that, to think through what is the wise thing to do with my future hopes and dreams? You're going to be somewhere because if you don't decide about these things, who's going to decide for you? You know. The pressures of our retail world, our consumption-driven world, that's who's going to tell you what to do. You know, uh, lenders, that's who's going to tell you what to do. Don't let that happen. And what's true financially is true relationally, academically, professionally. Or or, uh, how about this illustration? If you're single, if you're single, where do you want to be in your future relationships? You know, what what does that look like for you? And in light of what you ultimately want in a partner, in a future, in a spouse, is what you're doing now going to get you there? Or is what you're doing now going to undermine that preferred future? That's a hard question to answer, isn't it? I mean, it's really hard to know. Uh, But it gets back to the first question that we asked, which is, am I being honest with myself? Really? Am I being honest with myself? In light of what you want later, what is the wise thing to do now? And if you're married and you're planning to go the distance with your spouse and and you picture grandchildren in your future, if that is your preferred, if that's your dream, your hope for a preferred future, then what do you do now? What is the wise thing to do now to to make sure your marriage is strong and your connection is is strong and, you know, all the facets of life are, are, are strong? You got kids? I mean, come on, if you're a parent, what can you envision for your child right now in the future? What are you envisioning for your child right now? And what do you envision with your, about your relationship with your kids in the future? And is what you're doing now going to get you to that preferred future, that dream? Here's the thing, and you know this. I don't need to say it out loud, but I'll say it anyway. Is everybody ends up somewhere in life. I want you to decide to to live, to end up somewhere on purpose. On purpose. And the wisdom question will help you do that. What is the wise thing to do? So think about it. I mean, you know your story. You know that you are a unique blend of your 
your past experiences, your present circumstances, your future hopes and dreams. You are a unique blend of those things. There's nobody like you. And the wisdom question allows you to customize the decision-making process to your specific professional, academic, financial, spiritual aspirations. So ask the question, what is the wise thing for me to do? I think you owe it to yourself to know the answer to that, and I think the people that depend on you, they need it too. They need you to be asking that. What is the wise thing to do? So one last time, in light of your past experience, your current circumstances, your future hopes and dreams, what is the wise thing for you to do? And we're going to pick up next week right there where we're leaving off today with the fifth question of these five questions, the fifth question. But before we go... Um, I want to leave you with this. I want to challenge you. Okay, challenge is not a good enough word. I want to dare you. I dare you. I double dog dare you. Should I go the next step? Triple dead dog dare you. Take this question with you throughout this week. For the next seven days... I, mean, I don't know, write it on your hand or make it the, 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 the your screen, your lock screen on your phone or put it on a sticky note somewhere that you're going to see it. Put, for the next seven days, I dare you to keep this question in front of you and keep asking it when you face those, those decisions that amount to something, those decisions that, that are going to have an impact down the road that are going to ripple out from that one decision every day this week. I dare you. Keep asking the question. What is the wise thing to do? Uh, And and one final, final thought. Um, There's a possibility that you might be sitting here, somebody might be sitting here today thinking, this one hurts because I don't feel very wise. I feel like I've blown it so many times. I feel like I've done so many foolish things. That tends to be my my go-to response. Foolish things. If that's you, here's some really, really good news that comes from James, who was the brother of Jesus, who should know a few things, right? James wrote this. Check it out. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all, check this part out, without finding fault, and it will be given to you. Isn't that a great statement from the brother of Jesus? It's like, hey, the way I see it and the way I've experienced it in life is God loves it when we ask for wisdom. God loves to give us more wisdom. Why? Because God loves us and he wants the best outcomes for our lives. But God is not going to control you, right? God is not going to force your, because you've got free will, God's not going to force you to do something that you're not choosing to do. But when we ask for wisdom, God says, all right. Now you've opened that door, and I'll give you a little bit of wisdom here as you listen to this person and read this and take part in that, and your wisdom grows. We make better decisions. We have fewer regrets. What a great prayer. God, give me more wisdom. Then we ask the question, what's the wise thing to do? And we have everything we need to do it. And for today, that is the good news in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 